Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, and welcome to the members of the public up there. Um, I'm standing in for our chairman, Mrs. Elfs, who I think is um, off on holiday somewhere. Perhaps she knew something that I didn't. Anyway, uh, the usual housekeeping. Uh, could we please make sure that uh, our mobile phones are either switched to silent or switched off? There are no plans for a fire alarm test there this evening, so if you do hear a continuously ringing bell, there's a fire somewhere in the building probably, and we should get out as quickly as we can by the green marked exits, one over there, one there, and one to my right, and we all gather underneath the canopy outside Waitrose. And finally, members, can we please make sure that we've got our cards plugged in? We are being webcast. Moving on then to the agenda, item one on there, uh, to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of June, uh, they've been on the table for the last half hour or more. Is it your wish that I, that I sign them as a correct record? Thank you very much. Apologies for absence, please, Fiona. Thank you, Chairman. I've had apologies from councillors Mike Band, Kevin Dinas, Jenny Els and Val Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Anything? None received, Chairman. Uh, any late declarations, members? No? Questions by members of the public? None, Chairman. Uh, well, one of these days. And uh, any relevant updates to government guidance or legislation since the last meeting, Elizabeth? Thank you, Chairman. None in relation to this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are moving on then to um, applications for planning permission. We have just the one. Item A1, WA 2013-1947, stroke Cranley Brick and Tire Works, Noel A on Cranley. This is for the erection of 19 dwellings and associated works following the demolition of existing buildings, associated works including footpath works, improvements, remediation and restoration, as amended by information received on the 15th of August, the 27th of August and the 28th of August 2014. The application is accompanied by an environmental impact assessment as amended by information received on the 15th of August, the 27th of August and the 28th of August 2014. Barry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. If I take you first to this, it's not a um, tremendously good slide, but this opens up with the location plan of the site, which members will know is off Knoll Lane to the southeast of Cranley. Here we have an aerial photograph of the site showing the main parts of the old brickworks, the brickworking area, and the three large bodies of water, the lagoons, which are used as part, or part of the surface water management system on site. If I have, no, well, I'll take you now through a collection of photographs of the site. I'm afraid they're not in tremendously good quality, but good enough to get a feel for the state of the, uh, of the site. It's a derelict, despoiled site with deposits of waste on the outside areas. Some of the kiln has been um, uh, left in a, in a poor state and it is uh, shedding its RCFs, its refractory ceramic fibres and asbestos. I think Councillor Byam's trying to fix the lights. Yeah, yeah. I should I cancel the take these? So here I have a, a photograph of the air photograph again with the three water bodies and the brick working area, the hard standing and the works. Existing photographs show deposits of waste on the uh, area within the site outside of the buildings. The, this photograph shows a dilapidated state of some of the machinery and the kilns within said buildings. And here we have a photograph of the main brick work building, which has been left in a, in a poor state of repair. Here we have some photographs showing the leachate flowing out of the site at present, and another photograph showing the same. Now I'm going to take you through a collection of photographs showing you how 
one would access the site. So this is an aerial photograph of the A281 and the Wildwood Lane Junction. And here we have a, a photograph showing the junction. What I've highlighted here is the sign that indicates, you can see at the bottom, the Cranley Brickworks, highlighting that Wildwood Lane is the accepted HGV route for the application site. Here we now have it, as you're traveling along Wildwood Lane, you come across the Rugby Club at Cranley. Here we have a, a photograph showing the parking arrangements that that clubhouse enjoys. Next we have the cottages that front on to Knoll Lane. The HGV lorry movements would be tied to Wildwood Lane, Knoll Lane, and then entering the site off Knoll Lane. These are arguably the properties that would experience the most HGV movements. Here we have a, a photograph of said properties. Next, looking at the site, it's at this point where Knoll Lane breaks off and you have the site access road into the, uh, the brickworks. Here we have a photograph showing the access and that there is proposed improvements here for passing places and also to in in increase intervisibility, visibility space. So looking in the main at the application, the application is for the remediation of the site and for the erection of 19 dwellings as a form of enabling development to build or to enable the remediation of the site. Here we have some 3D images looking towards the southeast of the site. Here we have the existing with the brickwork buildings. This is hard standing. This greenery is, uh, is rather misleading because this is hard standing area. Then we have the proposal with the dwellings as indicated on the screen before the planting becomes established and then in the future when the landscaping scheme would take, take hold. Here we have 3D images looking to the northeast. Here we have that brickwork building again as existing with the bodies of water. You can see on this end of, of, the, of the image. Here we have before planting establishes and then at the bottom after the establishment of the planting. Here we have an example here of the house types. The application is in, is in full with um, uh, matters of, of, of design uh, conditioned as would be normally the case, but this is a type of property that is proposed. This is one of the semi-detached properties. The other properties are large, large properties. It's proposed to have six three-bed properties and 13 four-plus-bed properties. The six three-bed would be semi-detached. If I now take you to the determining issues. I will read them on screen and then I have a couple of slides extra. So the matters of principal technical opinion are the planning history, the changes in circumstances, urgency of a permanent solution, the loss of the existing use, waste matters, contaminated land, location of the development and the enabling development, housing land supply, housing mix, affordable housing, flooding, highway considerations, provision of amenity space and archaeological considerations. Looking at matters of judgment, we have those imp matters that impact on residential amenity, namely noise and air quality, the impact on the visual amenity and landscape of the area, and impact on heritage assets, and we have the planning balance judgment. If I take you to the planning history, members will be aware of a scheme that was submitted back in 2004 to the County Council for the, reme for the remediation of the site, known as the Cherokee Scheme. That was a scheme that involved the remediation. It was dealt with by the county and was approved in 2004. To enable that scheme to, to take place, the applicants... Sorry, that was permitted in 2005, rather. To enable that scheme to take place, the applicants apply to the local planning authority, us at Waverley, for an enabling form of development for 140 dwellings to fund the remediation that was put forward by Cherokee. That Cherokee remediation submitted in 2003, approved in 2005, was about £14 million worth of remediation. To pay for that, the, the developers needed to build 140 dwellings. That was refused by the local planning authority because of it being so unsustainable in terms of having a large housing development in an unsustainable location. The appeal was dismissed by the Planning Inspectorate. It was recovered by the Secretary of State, who also dismissed the appeal, upheld the inspector's decision, on grounds that the enabling development, or the benefits of the enabling development, 140 houses, did not clearly outweigh the harm. So the benefits of remediating the site back in 2008, when the inspector and the Secretary of State made their decision, were not, did not outweigh the harm of that 140 
dwellings. So what's happened since 2008? What are the changes in circumstances? Since 2008, we have the introduction of the National Planning Policy Framework in 2012, the National Planning Practice Guidance in 2014. They both advocate the voluntary remediation of contaminated sites. That's also supported by the National Waste Plan for England and the National Planning Policy for Waste. What we also have as a change in circumstances is the Water Framework Directive has significantly changed and now the levels of pollution which would be permissible into Collins Brook and into the wider water network, having, well, the levels have increased, they've become more st stringent, the levels you can pollute, pollute have dropped. So as a as way of example, zinc levels are allowed to, currently, or when the application was submitted to be around 250 units, it's going to be 75 units. The site currently pollutes 130 units. That's for zinc. That's one of the major pollutants on site. Modelling exercises would say that the level of pollution isn't diluted until you get to Bramley, which is where that zinc level has got to a suitable level in, in accordance with the Water Framework Directive. So we have the increasing stringency of the Water Framework Directive is a change in circumstances, and we also have the presence of asbestos and refractory ceramic fibres. Now, these would have been on the site in 2008, but the buildings were of a better quality. They weren't in such a derelict state. Since 2008, they have fallen into a state of dereliction, and they are now present on the surface and in the upper layers of the soil on site. Now, that is an issue that changes the circumstances in which we deal with this application. Now, looking at the urgency of, of finding a solution to this site, in... 2008, when the Secretary of State recovered this appeal, she decided that the urgency hadn't been articulated back in 2008. Skipping forward seven years, officers now conclude that this urgency, when weighed against a much reduced level of enabling development, 19 dwellings as opposed to 140 dwellings, the urgency in light of the Water Framework Directive and also now the presence of asbestos fibres on site has now got to a point where we think there is an urgent need to remediate a site and this scheme would secure that in a sustainable way. <coughs> so we now think we've got to a point where we address the concerns of the Secretary of State back in 2008 and an urgency case has been demonstrated. Now looking on loss of existing use. The application site enjoys the planning permission for the extraction of clay up until 2047. The Surrey Minerals Plan has a policy in it that protects clay deposits as, as a way of not sterilising that clay deposit for future use. We have sought the opinion of the, of the Minerals Authority, the Waste Minerals Authority, the County Minerals Authority, and they conclude that given this site hasn't actually been worked since 2005, the last bricks were, were fi fired in 2005, that the chance of this coming on stream again is very low and therefore they consider the loss of the existing use, the sterilisation of the mineral would be acceptable in this instance. Now turning our attention to waste matters. Now as I alluded to earlier on, in 2003 the application for the remediation of the site was submitted to the County Council as the Waste Planning Authority, not to the District Council. Now in your agenda on pages... Sixty sixty one of the of the agenda, you see why we have taken a different stance this time round. Members will be aware of the separation of powers of duties with regards to the district county and the county council, the district council and the county council. The, the county council deal with matters which are wholly to do with waste, and we deal with other matters. So the question we need to ask ourselves, as we discuss here, is whether this application is wholly for the treatment recovery of waste. We, as a district council, say it's not. This application is wholly for the purpose of remediating the land. It's not to deposit waste. The depositing of the waste achieves the remediation and therefore it falls squarely within our jurisdiction. This is supported by council's opinion submitted with the application and we've accepted that opinion, hence you're sitting here this evening dealing with it. So that's the first issue on the waste matter 
whose, whose jurisdiction does it fall within? It falls within ours as a district, can, a district council. Next, looking at waste management. Now, I don't want to labour on this too much because it, it, um, it, it, it's set out fully in the, in the report. But members may be aware of the waste framework directive, in particular Article 4 of the said directive, with regards to everybody having to employ the waste hierarchy. And that is changing the way we deal with waste and moving waste up the waste stream, taking it, it's an inverted triangle, moving from disposal as the last point of call with waste, taking it up to uh, re reduce, reuse, recycle, recovery. Re recovery, recycle, reduce, reuse. The County Waste Authority, as you'll see in Annex 1 of the report, consider that this is a waste disposal activity. Officers have sought advice from the Environment Agency and also external advice from Council, and we conclude it is a waste recovery activity, and therefore we are driving waste up the hierarchy, uh, as we should be doing. And the reason why we arrive at the conclusion it's a waste recovery, not a waste disposal, is because the material that's coming through the door, which we agree is a waste substance, is coming through the door to be used in place of other materials which would have to be used to achieve the same aim. What are those materials that would have to be used otherwise? They are um, capping uh, plastic layers, plastic drain, draining equipment, and also fr freshly mined mineral in the shape of clay that would have to come out to fulfil this need. Following council's advice, we are happy that this is a waste recovery matter and therefore the policies which the county say should be employed in their comments we consider not to be applicable, but notwithstanding we've taken the general gist of those policies, that is, is this the minimal amount of waste required to achieve the benefit? We say yes it is. The Environment Agency say yes it is. Although initially the Environment Agency had some questions, they went away, did some more work and came back saying this was the minimum amount of waste required to achieve the drainage that was proposed. We consider that therefore this policy meets with policies, or this proposal meets with policies in the waste plan. Next on screen is contaminated land. We have our contaminated land colleagues here to answer any specific questions on contaminated land, but I think we're all agreed that this is a heavily contaminated site. It has a special designation because of its levels of contamination, and that contamination is causing pollution into the controlled waters, and that pollution is causing problems in light of the Water Framework Directive. This scheme seeks, seeks to address that contamination through remediation, which I'll take you on to in a second. Next on matters of principal technical opinion is the location of the development and the enabling development. The erection of 19 dwellings on this site is no doubt contrary to policy. It's not in one of the main settlements and in accordance with paragraph 55 of the National Planning Policy Framework, they would be isolated dwellings. Paragraph 55 of the framework tells us we should only allow isolated dwellings in rural areas in special circumstances. One of those special circumstances could be to bring about a public benefit. In this instance, we are saying that there is a significant public benefit in the remediation of this site, and that benefit would clearly outweigh the harm of 19 dwellings being built in an unsustainable location. The government don't provide much advice with regards to enabling development, so our attention is drawn to the English Heritage advice on enabling development, and in there you ask yourself the question, are there funding from another source to achieve the benefit? In this case, no, there isn't. DEFRA's, DEFRA's budget is about 0 0.7 million and runs out in 2017, so therefore there is no access to other funds to achieve this remediation. Is it the minimum quantity of development required to achieve the, to achieve the public benefit? In support of that, the applicants have submitted a robust viability assessment. We've had that viability assessment tested by the district valuer. We've asked questions of it, we've gone back and forth, and we've got to a point now where the district valuers say that this proposal is the minimum amount of development required to bring about the community benefit, which is the remediation of the site. Therefore, officers conclude that this is a form of enabling development. By being a form of enabling development, it is a special circumstance, as set out in paragraph 55 of the framework. Looking now at housing land supply, as we know, we should, in accordance with paragraph 47, 48 of the framework, have five years' worth of housing land supply. We don't. We're on about 3.6 to 3.8. The absence of a five-year housing land supply is a significant consideration. However, in this instance, the houses wouldn't be built until after the five years, so in year six and seven of the programme. 
So whilst they don't help in meeting our five-year housing land supply, they do help in meeting our longer-term objective of delivering homes, and therefore that is a benefit of some weight. Now on to housing mix. The proposal is for three and four plus bedrooms. This is not what the Schmar says that we need in the borough. There is a need, when I say there's not a need, there is a need for three and four bed dwellings, but this undoubtedly wouldn't create a mixed and balanced community. It would be 19 large dwellings, but it's 19 large dwellings which will fund the remediation of the site. If we looked for a mix of housing commensurate with the Schmar, there would have to be more than 19 dwellings. So there is a, a balancing act that would have to be undertaken in that regard. This is the same for affordable housing. The proposal would not offer any affordable housing on the same grounds that if they were to offer affordable housing, that would impact on the viability of the scheme, which would then drive up the need for extra dwellings, which would then, we'll be in a spiral of having to build extra dwellings to provide affordable homes, and we'll find ourselves in an upward spiral. So this proposal does not um, support any affordable housing, and this is in line with the framework, national planning policy framework, that tells us where the delivery of affordable homes would question the viability of a scheme, we should be flexible. Next, looking at flooding, there are, in this case, the flooding areas would be surface water flooding, which at the moment, surface water drainage is the reason why this site is polluting Collinsbrook. The, the water falls from the sky in the form of rain, falls on the site, and then runs to the brook, or, uh, to, the, to, the, to the lagoons rather, taking the pollutants with them, and then the lagoons let out into Collinsbrook when the environment agencies say there's sufficient water in the brook to dilute it, and then it, it runs out. This proposal has a comprehensive surface water drainage strategy that would see no future leachate into Collinsbrook or into the controlled waters, it being dealt with on site under a new leachate management facility, a new surface water drainage system, which would take fresh water into the stabilised and cleaned up quarry and the leachate dealt with on site. Looking at highway considerations, it, it's of no doubt that the roads to Cranley Brick and Tile are not, uh, are not what could be or what you might, might build if you were bringing HGV lorries to this site, but they are what they are. Wildwood Lane is, is a country lane and Knoll Lane is a country lane. However, the Highways Authority have fully assessed the scheme and subject to um, the cutting back of verges on Wildwood Lane, the cutting back of vegetation on the 281, the clearing of vegetation at the access point to the site, the reinstatement of some curbing edges on Wildwood Lane, the introduction of signage, the introduction of anti-skid materials, the County Highway Authority, when asking themselves the question in line with paragraph 32 of the framework, would this proposal have cumulative impacts of a severe nature? They answer that it would not. Subject to the imp uh, implementation of that mitigation package, it would be acceptable. Now looking at provision of amenity space, a scheme of 19 dwellings would be expected to provide area of amenity space. Looking at the screen in front of us, there is significant areas of open meadow and open fields in which to provide that amenity space for any future occupiers of the site. Archaeological considerations, given that this site is a quarry and anything that was of value has been dug up and, and taken away, the chances of finding anything of, of note have, are significantly diminished and therefore officers consider that all policies with regards to archaeological considerations have been met. Now looking at matters of judgment on the right hand side of the screen, these are the, are the main issues really is impact on residential amenity. From the site working to remediate and also the, ship, the movement of vehicles to the site in the back of HGV lorries. Firstly, looking at noise from access vehicles into, for HGV vehicles accessing the site. The information submitted with the application, which is an environmental impact assessment application, so we have lots of folders here. The noise assessment there would demonstrate that there would be an increase in noise as a result of HGV vehicles in the area. That increase would be about 3.4 decibels, which is getting at a level of being barely perceptible to the average human. Officers therefore consider that the impact of vehicles coming to the site would not be materially, would not have a significant adverse impact so as to warrant a refusal. Now when they come onto site, we have a host of conditions to control noise at the boundaries, boundaries which are 
heavily planted with uh, trees which will provide significant buffering. Um, so noise levels at the boundaries to be controlled and noise levels at the nearest residential properties to be controlled. So therefore, we don't think noise would be an issue as this site works for the five and a half years if that is to be proposed. Looking at air quality, um, the HGV lorries have to meet certain standards and therefore the introduction of HGV lorries in this area should not have a significant impact on air quality. When we get onto site, there is an air quality management plan that will control air quality at the site to a level that officers don't consider would have an impact on air quality in the immediate area. Taking ourselves now to impact on visual amenity and landscape, the site can be described as falling in two main areas, the brickworking areas and the countryside around, the perimeter woodland. To the east of the site is an area of great landscape value, which does have qualities and is successful in creating a distinct pattern and sense of place. There's no doubt about it that this development is at the moment a despoiled, derelict industrial site in an area of countryside, and it is having a negative impact. Officers can see they're subject to the landscaping scheme that would be um, controlled by way of condition, that this site could blend in with that wider countryside in a way that would significantly improve the current situation. Looking now at impact on heritage assets, the site is a heritage asset being a historic brickwork site. It's been a brickwork site for nearly 200 years. Initially 200 years ago brickworks, then it turned into a chemical works in the mid part of the, of the 20th century. It became before then, rather, it became an ammunitions depot for the government in the Second World War. It was a chemical work. Then it was a brickworking place again. So it has a rich history, but a rich history which is associated with the use as opposed to any of the buildings that are on site. As you've seen, the buildings are of relatively poor quality. So given that, officers consider that the proposal would not have a detrimental impact on heritage assets. And in any event, given that this would be a non-designated heritage asset, paragraph 135 of the framework tells us to, to have a balancing act would the public benefit outweigh the harm of the loss? In this instance, officers suggest it would. Now taking you on to the planning balance and judgment, we are told by the framework of paragraph 197 that we should be dealing with planning applications in line with the presumption of sustainable development. Now what does that mean? Paragraph 14 of the framework tells us that it means we should be approving developments unless the adverse impacts of doing so significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. In this case, we have a officers considered to be the huge benefit of the remediation of the site, but that is counterbalanced some way by the adverse impacts, which would be a change in character of the area for a period of five and a half years through the importation of significant volume of waste, one HGV lorry every nine minutes for five and a half days, for five and a half years. That will have an impact on the character and appearance of the area and that is an adverse impact that you'd have to weigh against the benefits. If I now take you in more detail about the remediation of the site in general, the remediation is split into three stages. Stage one, the pre-commencement works. Stage two, the remediation works at large. And then stage three, the construction of, of the dwellings. Looking at stage one in detail, stage one is the works involved with bringing in some of the highway improvements, bringing the office on site, bringing the, setting up the compound on site, bringing on some material so as to provide a working area to erect eco ecological, in, ecological fencing to keep newts out of the centre of the site. This site does have significant newt population, so to control the newt population, and also um, some of the initial stripping works would be part of those pre-commencement works. Then we go on to the remediation works at large, which can be separated into five phases. Phase one being the fibre control and site clearance. As I've already alluded to, this site has an asbestos problem. Phase one would be bagging the large bulk asbestos, taking it away in a controlled way in accordance with the permitting regulations, and then demolishing buildings and in a phased manner, providing a cover level so as to provide a safe working area for the people working on site. So demolish a building, provide a cover level of about two metres of, of waste to work on, and then gradually work through the site until you have a base layer of fibre control and the site is cleared of buildings. You then go on to phase two, which is the initial leachate control. That is providing a low-level cap of about 
uh, half a meter at the bottom of the uh, on top of that fiber control area so as to channel surface water into a new area on site this will be relatively clean water it will be controlled at the bottom at the lowest level of the site to the east of the site then we go on to western regulating capping cover and finishes this is then desludging the quarries, taking, taking the water out, taking all the nasty stuff out of those quarries, stabilizing them, putting them in the center of the site, and then encapsulating them in the waste. Then we go quarry restoration. This would be the restoration of the quarry so as to provide a safe body of water for future surface water management. That would be dewatering, as I've said, taking the sludge out, stabilizing it, then bringing material back on site to create softer profiles to create a site which is not a hazard at the moment that quarry is significantly deep and has sheer sides we then go on to eastern regulating capping and cover and finishes that will be then be the final importation of material clay capping over the top and then providing that final clay cap a final cover level over the top for the uh, planting of the trees and creating the open meadow and then we go on to the dwelling construction phase the dwelling constructions will only start when the site has met all its remediation levels, has been signed off by the environmental health colleagues here and by the Environment Agency, and then we, we say that the site is now capable of being used for its intended purpose. This all involves the importation of 525,000 cubic metres of suitable material for 490-odd thousand cubic metres of that will be suitable non-hazardous waste controlled by the Environment Agency under the, environment, under the environmental permit they'll have to obtain. The rest of it would be clean material brought in under the CLARE protocol and won't constitute waste. As I've said, all that material will be, will be brought on the back of HGV lorries coming from the 281 onto Wildwood Lane, onto Knoll Lane and into the site at an average of one movement per every nine minutes. Now that may seem like a lot of vehicles because of course it is a significant number of HGV movements but it's important to note that these HGV lorries are already within the vicinity of the site it becomes uneconomical to take waste on the back of lorries significant distances one of the main reasons being that chances are you've passed somewhere where you can drop it off before you drive to the next place so you try and get the waste to the nearest possible place in the most economical way so you're talking 15 20 miles so it's already within that radius of the site these hgv vehicles are already moving the chances are that most of this waste will come from those large developments you see in horsham or large developments in guildford that is in all likelihood where this material will come from and it will come on the 281 down Wildwood Lane and into the application site. Those HGV movements, as I've said, necessitate some highway improvements. On screen now, we have a list of highway improvements which are proposed in order to facilitate the safe transportation of the material. So we have improvements to the Belmouth Junction with Knoll Lane from the application site, the introduction of hazard warning signs and HGV signs on Wildwood Lane and Knoll Lane, no works traffic signs to stop any works traveling north on Knoll Lane, cutting back the vegetation within the highway at Knoll Lane and Wildwood Lane so as to maximize visibility space, to provide speed limit repeater signs on Wildwood Lane in accordance with the scheme to be submitted and approved by the County Highway Authority. Then we have cutting back the vegetation within the highway verge along Wildwood Lane and where necessary undertake works to reinstate the edge of the carriageway. Then we have provide safety improvements at the 281 Guildford Road Junction with Wildwood Lane. That's extending the anti-skid surface by about 100 metres to the south. And cutting back of vegetation on the western side of the 281 to increase all with forward visibility space. And then to provide an additional side road, side road ahead sign as you're coming north from Oldfold to let people know that the turn in for Cranley Brickworks is coming up and therefore for them to take necessary action. If I now take you to the update sheet, you'll see on page one and the start of page two of the update sheet, we've had a significant number of documents submitted by the applicant at the end of last week. Now, this information is to enable the applicant, if permission is granted, to start work this, this season. 
they need to do some ecological work this season, August, September. So these, this information here is, has been submitted to enable us to change some of the conditions so as to take out some of the works to enable them to start the ecological enhancements early in the programme so as they haven't got to wait till next year to do the works that they're looking to do. So that's on page one. We have that extra information on page two. Uh, sorry, what is important to note on page one is following con the uh, discussions with the local members for Bramley and um, Hascom. I always get Hascom and Hambledon mixed up. It is Hascom, Bramley, Hascom, isn't it? Hascom, yes. Sorry, I always get the two mistaken. Um, the applicants have now agreed to fund £10,000 toward the parish council so as to facilitate the re repeater speed signs by the school there so as to meet the concerns of the residents of Bramley. Bramley will, out of the villages within Waverley, take that traffic, HGV movements, up and down. What we also have is a requirement in the legal agreement to establish a community liaison body. That liaison body will require the uh, working with those cottages on Wildwood Lane to undertake monitoring of any impact vibra from vibration of HGV movements and to undertake a structural survey and then to work to rectify any problems that may be caused. It is important to note, though, that environmental impact assessment concludes that there would not be any impact from vibration. Looking at number two now, page two, we have the County Highway Authority. The County Highway Authority are confirming that they're happy for some of the conditions to be altered to take out pre-commencement works before they have to start some of the Section 278 works. We then have comments from the Council's Environmental Health Officer with regards to noise and light at the application site and suggests, suggesting a number of conditions. We have an, an additional representation from a property on Knoll Lane, one of the cottages. And there, the comments we talk about the, re the remediation timescale, the Cranley Brick and Tile Works contamination, who is responsible for cleaning it up, vibration surveys, traffic movement times, Hazelwood cottages parking, and Wildwood Lane safety issues. They're covered in full on pages 9 and 10 of the report. And then on pages 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, we have new conditions and informatives. That clear up the extra comments from, the cons from our consultees and also address the change of conditions to allow pre-commencement works to take place before development would start. If I now take you on to the revised recommendation, that is as set out on the screen, that having regard to the environmental information contained in the application, the accompanying, the accompanying environmental statement as amended, together with responses to it, the proposals for mitigation, and subject to the applicant entering into an appropriate legal agreement by the 31st of July to secure a long-term management plan to include the method, management, and maintenance of the following, the SUDS, the capping system, the leachate facility, the visitor car park, the open space, except residential garden areas, the internal highway, the foul sewerage system, the ecological habitat in line with landscape and ecology management plan, the cessation of all existing uses, a contribution towards the making of a traffic regulation order, the delivery of off-site highway improvement works, the establishment of a community liaison group to include vibration monitoring and survey, and a contribution of £10,000 toward Bramley Parish Council for highway signage improvements, permission to be granted, subject to conditions set out within the agenda, and as amended above, and additional conditions, 58 to 65, and the addition of reasons for said conditions. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. There we have... Uh, Two speakers. Firstly, Mr. Leon. You have uh, three minutes. After two and a half, you will get um, an indication on the lights there. And after three minutes, I'll let you wind up with two or three sentences. Then I will have to stop you. When you're ready, please. Uh, thank you, councillors, for providing me with this opportunity to talk to you on behalf of the uh, Hazelwood residents. Firstly, I'd like to point out that the responsibility of the containment of the contaminants on this site sits squarely with the current owners. 
They knowingly acquired the site and with it the responsibility for any water quality issues that they have to meet by 2020. It is their responsibility alone and not that of the local community planning authority. We believe that this should be enforced by prior to any planning application for houses on this site. I live at Hay one Hazelwood Cottages. This row of six cottages is only six metres from Knoll Lane and will be most affected by this application. This is causing considerable stress to the residents of the cottages. The site requires a massive 525,000 cubic metres of waste to fill it. We request that councillors seriously question this amount as necessary to remediate this site before granting permission. We feel that commercial gain is being placed before local residents. Residents will have to endure 70 HGV movements per day. These 32 and 40 tonne lorries are, two, are wider than two and a half metres and um, that's 40 centimetres wider than a uh, dust cart. There, are, there will be lorry movements past the cottages every nine minutes, Monday to Friday, and a half day Saturday for a minimum period of five and a half years. This will have a huge impact on our lives as well as the saleability of our homes. Therefore, we request a defined time stop period to be imposed. The supplementary information lodged against the application states that the systems for the disposal of foul effluent from the site is unknown, as is the location of the sustainable urban drainage system for surface water runoff. Although the Environment Agency have been consulted, we are aware that SUDS is not their area of expertise and we cannot stress enough the potentials, potentially serious nature of the effluent on this site. These SUDS should be passed by Surrey County Council as the lead local flood authority. It is crucial that Hazelwood Cottages and Lawns Cottages residents are not put at risk. In last year's floods in Chertsey, a seven-year-old child died and his father was paralysed due to water contamination from a nearby landfill entering their house. We cannot stress enough, public safety must be paramount. This all, must also extend to the highways. Uh, the, the country lanes are part of the popular Surrey cycleway and a cut through to Cranny for school runs. We know the road very well and cannot see how the proposed lorry passing places can be achieved. The eastern end of Wildwood Lane has blind bends and a dangerous four metre pinch points and there are no opportunities for passing places. At the, end of the other, at the other end of Wildwood Lane there are also another four metre pinch point across a culvert. A maximum of 6.75 metres is required for two HGVs to pass safely. The road is simply unsafe for the size of vehicle to use uh, six days a week. When I posed the question if planning was granted and accidents with lorries occurred with serious injury or worse still a death, what would happen? The answer to me was nothing. We, ex we cannot accept nothing as an answer. If councillors today have any safety fears then we respectfully request you refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr Hull? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, as you know, the proposals have been subject to around five years of discussions that the applicant has had with local authority officers, the Environment Agency, various councillors, the MP, members of the public. Uh, we've carried out site visits, uh, invitations open to all who are interested, and specific public consultations and uh, exhibitions. A key message that has come through out all of this period is the balance that needs to be struck between uh, and the direct relationship between the material that's brought in and, and heavy goods vehicles uh, traffic. As members know, there's a direct relationship with the, between the amount of material needed for, for the remediation and the number of HGV movements. Uh, as discussed earlier, we've had meetings with some of the most affected um, residents, particularly at the Wildwood Lane, Knoll Lane Junction. And uh, we've talked about how we could mitigate the impacts. And I just wanted to uh, make a note of of what we've agreed. Um, first point really is the uh, house condition survey that we would offer to residents at that junction. And this would be specific monitoring of vibration impacts and a commitment to resolve any vibration uh, damage that's directly attributable to the HGVs. Um, just as an additional point, um, the vehicles that we would be using uh, are modern, smaller and lighter than the HGVs that were typically used 20 or 30 years ago for the brickworks. And we feel that, on balance, that does 
result in a, a potential, at least, for a, a better traffic environment. Um, as discussed earlier, there will be a liaison group that will be set up, which will be chaired by a representative from the development company. And, um, and also, we've agreed to uh, sort of the operating time restrictions, um, which for a construction industry is typically 7.30 to 6 o'clock, Monday to Friday, and 8 till 1 on Saturday. We've agreed to no working, obviously, on Sundays and bank holidays, which is standard. But we've also furthermore agreed to uh, only half the Saturdays in any calendar year, so 26 out of a pos possible 52. We're also proposing a management system to be put in place to monitor HGV vehicles and how drivers perform on the local roads and employ a system where it's effectively three strikes and the driver is refused access uh, to the site. Um, obviously, you know that one of the, uh, the applicants is um, whose business is in HGV uh, traffic um, knows how to manage these sorts of situations and we can commit to uh, a management regime that works. The planning application also proposes to restrict the number of daily vehicle movements, carry out works which you've heard about to the um, local highway network, including the passing places, the signage uh, and new road surfaces. Um, we feel confident that on the basis of the proposed restrictions, the five and a half year remediation period is viable and that we can minimise any impacts to the local community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Hull. Members. Mrs Ellis. Thank you, Chairman. This site was actually due to, um, previous to some boundary changes. It used to be in my ward. I do know the site quite well, and I feel that I've been on quite a number of site visits over the years, although not previously. And the reason we didn't go prior to this application being considered this evening was really because it was considered to be too dangerous to visit and this bears out, I think, that the site is very heavily contaminated by a variety of pollutants that are entering into the water system, the controlled water system. Since I last visited the site, further dangerous pollutions, pollutants have been discovered, and I think asbestos has been mentioned, and we all know the, the dangers of asbestos. The officer's report is very extensive, and for that I, I commend them and thank them very much. It was very informative. But it has confirmed, to my personal satisfaction, the need, that the need for action is actually urgent. And I think over the years, we've all thought the, the need for action was urgent, and it's increased re more recently. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm certainly not an expert in any way on re remediation, but sufficient evidence that I think that there is sufficient evidence that a lower level of restoration could lead to more polluted leachate being generated. And I'm thinking of a landfill site off the A281, where after a number of years, work being carried out, further extensive work was required to, to make this, safe, this site safe. And I think that also included removing all of the polluted um, parts of the, the site. And they weren't, if you like, anywhere near as dangerous, I think, as the pollutants on this particular site. I think that the terms of remediation proposals proposed offer a permanent solution um, to the dangers of the pollution. But it does come at a huge cost. And I'm not talking about financial cost. I'm talking about cost in terms of disruption that 
and detrimental impact on the lives of the people who live in the immediate area. And I think we can all acknowledge Hazelwood Cottages would be very severely impacted by this. And this is proposed for five, five and a half years have to put against that the fact that the site is currently derelict as well as dangerous and to the enabling development would introduce undesirable uh, urban residential development in what is a predominantly rural setting and I think that that is not appropriate and contrary to established policies. The proposals enabled, the proposed, sorry, enabling development is unsustainable in terms of its location, its remoteness, absence of public transport, absence of employment that would actually lead to heavy reliance on the car in an area of narrow, winding country roads that are poorly maintained in the main, and also the lack of pavements. Moving on to Wildwood Lane itself, which I believe is, as indicated, is the accepted heavy goods vehicle route. It's a narrow, winding road. And I think it's, the, it's only acceptable as a, as a route because it is better than actually what drivers would face in Noel Lane. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination anyone would think that Wildwood Lane was really designed or can properly accept this number of heavy goods vehicle movements. I'm seriously concerned. It's a narrow winding road, blind corners. I really don't think as I drive down that road quite regularly, that two lorries could safely pass each other in a number of places. And I doubt that reversing is anything other than a very dangerous um, occurrence. Nothing is really going to make Wildwood Lane really acceptable for this level of use by heavy goods vehicles. I'm concerned that there remains a 40 mile per hour speed limit on this road because even at the best of times, 40 miles per hour is probably too fast for vehicles traveling on that road. And I wonder whether there might be an opportunity should this permission be granted for that speed limit to be reduced on a, perhaps a temporary basis. My initial thoughts, and I'm open to listening to all of my colleagues here, that there is a desperate need for this remediation. I'm not convinced, as suggested by a respected organization quoted in the report, that the impacts of granting permission outweigh the advantages. Being realistic about this, I don't think really that there's any chance of the necessary remediation being carried out without enabling development. And I think, as has been mentioned to us, the previous Cherokee application actually involved a huge number of properties, and that perhaps it doesn't, if it's going to happen with this number of properties, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, I'm not sure about anyone living on this site in this remote position. I'm not sure that anyone will want to, to buy a property there. I'm sorry to say I probably wouldn't. Um, but it's obviously been a business decision by, by the purchase of the site, and they have addressed that particular question. I have to say I'm deeply deeply unhappy about subject, subjecting existing residents to over five, five years, five and a half years of what will no doubt be, to my mind, be a hellish experience. I think it will be awful for them. 
and I do hope that actually should permission be granted that it will not be as bad as I anticipate and probably they do as well. My overriding feeling at the moment is that this needs to be done to protect residents in the immediate vicinity of the site and as the contaminated lagoons overflow and they do quite regularly causing contamination at Bramley we've heard and further afield as well I have serious concerns about the work not being done and the fact that this probably might be the best way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nice. Mr. Goodrich. Chairman, I um, endorse a lot of what Councillor Ellis has said. And this is an application where we have to rely upon a large number of experts' reports. Um, I, too, am not an expert in how to cap waste and the amount of soil and the different types of ingredients that have to be put on top of it and how you remove it. Um, but I do accept that when we are told that now it is urgent, that um, we can't ignore that advice. Clearly, when you've got asbestos fibres... Uh, on the ground. I mean, I'm concerned and I don't know the details, at least I haven't found the details of how the vehicles are going to be washed before they leave the site, but I'm told the arrangements for washing the vehicles is, has been arranged because it's, um, it would be a bad news all round if the vehicles leaving the site had asbestos on their tyres and were depositing the asbestos fibres outside the site. I, um, I'm satisfied that, that we have the jurisdiction, having read the report, because it's a judgment that, uh, that this is an issue of remediation, not waste, and, and I'm, I, I agree that we have jurisdiction. I, I too agree that you know, it's impossible to get a housing mix that's going to, for example, include affordable houses when you're in, in a a site like this where, as Councillor Edison has said, you're only going to get to it by car um, to put in affordable housing without any other facilities in the neighbourhood would be um, unwise and therefore um, it, it's going to be necessary to have big houses where presumably they're going to have big 4 by 4s to go with it but, um, but um, that will be probably inevitable. I too am concerned about the highway movements and how it will affect the residents. I, I don't know whether, for example, um, double glazing all the houses that haven't got double glazing might be something that could be considered um, because the noise of lorries going past all the time would be one of the things that uh, I would be unhappy about. Um, we're told, again, experts reports that that vibration is unlikely to cause damage to these houses. But it's just the, the, the number of vehicle movements going past. There's no, so far as I can see from reading all the reports, there's no other means of getting to this site. Um, it's got to be that route. And we've got to remove, because the expert reports tell us, we've got to move so many tons of soil and we've got to bring in, or of waste, and we've got to bring in so many tons of clay and soil, um, because that's what the experts say. And it would be totally wrong in my book to carry out the remedial work in a half-hearted fashion. It's got to be done properly, particularly when you think there's going to be people living even closer to the contaminated site, namely the 19 households that are going to be living there. Uh, and therefore it's very important that the job is done totally and, and, and efficiently and properly. And if that means so much soil has got to come in and so much soil has got to come out, then it's got to be. And what is the other alternative? The other alternative is to do nothing and then have an even worse situation with contaminants getting all over the area, which will affect everybody. So um, 
at the moment I, I am feeling um, with a slight heavy heart that there's no alternative but to go along with the officer's recommendation, which we have a very full report, analyzing, for example, the number of houses that are necessary to, to make it uh, a viable proposition. That's all been looked at again by experts, and, and I feel that we just have to go along with what the experts are telling us. And the judgment, I suppose, is is, is minor compared to the experts report which which tell us what's got to be done thank you chairman thank you mr goodrich mrs farishevsky thank you chairman um councillor goodridge had has used many of the words that i was going to use um no alternative no, I, as i used to be the ward member for this area so i know this site very very well and its background and I find myself between a rock and a hard place here because it is so, so difficult because we're dealing with two issues here. We're dealing with um, a site that is highly contaminated and we need to do something about it based against um, providing houses in a, an unsustainable location, um, which is not exactly what we're looking for in Waverley at the moment. Um, I, there's a few things I do question here as well. Back in 2004-05, 140 dwellings were deemed more harmful than the contamination. So, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves why we've allowed it to continue to get as bad as it has. And also we talk about um, making um, improvements to Knoll Lane and Wildwood Lane in terms of visual splays and so forth. I mean, these are things we should be doing as commonplace. Anyway, our roads should always be safe and free from hazards and not have hidden blind spots where they're going to have. Um, I, 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 it really is a difficult one because of the, anyway, there's going to be a high price to pay for re remediation on this site. Where I have my biggest and gravest concern, as Councillor Goodrich has said, we're not experts and we're looking to the experts to guide us on this. The, the, the contaminants on sites are, are, are really, really quite horrendous. And are we confident, and I know we have to take the experts' view, but are we confident that what the measures we're taking now will prevent this site in the future from any sources of contamination leaking out in the future? Because I think the only way that I could be comfortable, but I know that it's impractical to even suggest it, let alone think about it, is that if all contaminants were removed off site, but that clearly doesn't seem to be an option. So are we confident that we can maintain the contaminants on site using the measures that have been put forward? And Chairman, with your indulgence, please, can I just ask um, from one of the officers an, an opinion on how bad is the situation now compared to how bad it was, say, 10 years ago? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Barry? If I can start with the future and how we can ensure the pollution control will be um, captured. One thing I, I, I should draw members' attention to is paragraph 122 of the framework. And it, it goes along the lines of what Councillor Goodridge said. So paragraph 122 of the framework tells us that local planning authorities should focus on whether the development itself is, in a, is an acceptable use of the land and the impact of the use, rather than the control of processes or emissions themselves, where these are subject to approval under pollution control regimes. Local planning authorities should assume that these regimes will operate effectively. This site will be controlled by an environment agency and the permitting of bringing waste on site. They will control that, and we have to assume that they will control it effectively. In addition to that, notwithstanding the EA's roles and responsibilities, if you look at condition 38 on the, uh, well, page 105, probably easy to get to, condition 38 talks of a construction management plan which needs to be drawn together in, consult in consultation with the environment agency. That needs to go through a construction quality assurance criteria for the engineered composite capping systems and any underground cells needs to have um, approval from the EA for the leachate and surface water management protocols, the phasing of the works, the volumes and specifications of all imported materials. So that's paragraph 38. But then we go on, we've got paragraph 39, talks about future verification plans. Paragraph 40 talks about remediation strategies. We've got paragraph 41 covering the sewage system. So there's about 10 different conditions here 
that in addition to the controls of the EA, we also have extra controls. So whilst I can't say here and say nothing will ever happen in the future, but to the best of, of our ability at this point in time, the evidence in front of us demonstrates that this site will be acceptable for its future use as residential if members are minded to grant this evening. It will become a site which is capable of accommodating residential use, and that means capable of people growing vegetables in the garden, children going outside and accidentally eating soil. That type of stuff that goes on in normal dwellings in normal areas should be able to go on in this site and will, will be safe to do so. With regards to the site getting worse, we have a look in our, in our report. With regards to pollution on site getting worse, the pollution levels the zinc and what are, are staying the same. You know, they're not, the half-life of these substances is significant. They're not going anywhere. The change is really in the legislation that controls the amount of these things that can get into the controlled waters. And they, the levels are dropping and the contamination isn't dropping significantly. So that's staying where it is. The quality levels are dropping. Therefore, this site is exceeding those, those goals. I don't know whether the environmental health have anything else to, to add. Thank you, Ah, thank you. I think it's important to note that once this remediation is finished and the special site designation has been removed, we again have further controls before they start the residential development, pre-commencement conditions, that the areas for the residential housing are assessed again against the criteria for residential use. And we put that in specifically to ensure that we could be sure that the area would be ready and suitable for housing. Um, one of the reasons that the developers and the Environment Agency have accepted that the actual um, degree of remediation, the height of it, the amount of waste, is especially to make sure that it is long term and that it does last. If they had gone for a lesser remediation solution, they would have had to use artificial membranes that don't last as long that have a 100-year lifespan. So the whole thing has been designed to be as permanent a solution as is reasonably possible. And that's something that's been looked at very carefully through the whole process, and I can assure you it has been looked at in depth. Um, the, the project team have used very reputable consultants, experts in their field, and I, all along, all of our questions have been answered quickly, completely, and we have confidence in the plans that have been put forward. Thank you for allowing me to come back, Chairman. You know, I'm not going to argue with um, these experts, um, but also I'm, not, I'm going to question Mother Nature because she has a funny way of um, retribution when it comes to us um, not being very nice to the planet. Um, are we saying then that the trade-off is five and a half years of you know, residents suffering and not having pleasant experiences because of the quality of life is going to be affected by lorry movements and so forth and so forth, against five and a half years, this being a, a, a site now that we can say is contaminant free. So is that the trade-off? Thank you, Chairman. Yes. I suppose one could consider really whether or not, to, you know, uh, five and a half years of... Uh, uh, lorries moving backwards and forwards every nine minutes, uh, bringing in waste and soil to cover the contaminated area. Uh, is that going to be any easier uh, than quite possibly five and a half years of lorries loaded with the contaminants from this site and carting them away elsewhere? But uh, just... I, if I could just pick up on one thing that you said, that uh, uh, once remedi remediation has been completed and the special site designation removed, I suppose I'm a little worried that should anything go wrong with this remediation in the future, where do we then stand? Because at the moment, the special site designation uh, leaves it with the Environment Agency. And we manage, I think, courtesy of one of our, our past chief executives, moving it from the responsibility of this borough council to the Environment Agency. Does that then mean, should something go wrong in the future, it becomes Waverley's responsibility again? Uh, 
if I can just start and then pass over to, to Anya. First and foremost, it's important to note that the legal agreement that would tie the developers up if permission were to be granted forces them to set up a management company to employ competent people to constantly, well not constantly, to, to check the cap at regular levels to make sure the capping is still in, in its uh, condition and if any problems arise with the cap to fix it and also to control the leachate management facility that is proposed and if any problems arise to fix the problems. With that there is a trust fund to be set up. That trust fund is all part of the legal agreement and is, um, is partly funded by some of the waste coming in, gate receipts, and also from, from the dwellings. That would fund the management company to do this. But going forward, if there is a pollution problem, I shall let Anya tell you how we deal with it. Um, how Part 2A works, that's the legislation, the Environmental Protection Act 1990. Whilst it's a special site and that the Environment Agency currently manages, the decisions are enacted by Waverley. So the removal of the special site status will be recommended by the Environment Agency to us, but we will d decide to put that in place, which obviously won't happen until we have been satisfied and we've taken advance, uh, advice to ensure that we are satisfied that everything that should have been done has been done. You know, the, everything in this remediation plan has been planned to put a permanent cap in place so that we do not anticipate future issues. That's why we don't have a water treatment plant. That's why um, they, they've done everything they can to come up with sustainable solutions that manage themselves, so we're not worrying about membranes. And, and that's particularly one of the reasons why I've been able to support this scheme. Does that answer your question? Mr. Byer. Thank you, Chairman. Well, we've had some very good um, statements and questions from members and some interesting questions. Um, Councillor Ellis mentioned the, the site at Smithbrook Kiln, um, which, to be honest, I'd forgotten about to some degree, um, except a couple of nights ago, the, our previous parish clerk reminded us when we, we, we met up at a, at a gathering that there was, that was took two years to clear, to cart all of the contaminated material away. It was a waste dip which had gone wrong under old regimes and, and things of like that. And there were 60 vehicles a day for two years. Okay, it's not 70 for five and a half years, nowhere near the level. But nevertheless, 60 for two years. I think after a little while, we probably forgot about it. But that's, we're not living, you know, the village is not on top of that area. But it's, it's, it went on and it was achieved. Uh, and it's now a safe site. Obviously, the houses that are close by are going to be the most affected, uh, and it, it doesn't seem any way that we can do anything more to them other than bring Chinooks in to try to lift all the stuff out by air. I think that might be a little bit uh, severe a way of dealing with it. But, it's, but it is a, a dramatic problem um, which needs to be dealt with. I mean, again, I don't think I remember hearing the comment that Barry made at the beginning about the, the waters at Bramley being contaminated. I've often asked the question about the water at Bramley being contaminated because I've seen or, or, or seen less of or no fish now in the water stream which is um, towards beyond the end of my garden. Um, but I've always been concerned that there was contamination but I wasn't told about it. And what that level is I don't know but the fish life has gone or at least it appears to be got, have gone. And I've certainly restricted my grandchildren, who are, who are, are now very keen kayakers and, and canoeists, not to go in there because of the possible contamination that's there. So I think we, we have to get on with the job. Um, I don't see a way around it. Um, the, the one concern that's coming out is, you know, the people, well, first of all, the, the, the houses that are there and the damage or, or potential disruption to their lives, which is difficult to see how we can improve on that. But equally, the 19 dwellings that are going to be put on the site, I always remember from the previous scheme, and I think from this scheme, and we're not saying it at the moment, that those houses were not going to be put anywhere near the contaminated land. It's not on there. It's in a site. That, and if something went wrong, I suppose, then you could contain that contaminated area away from the dwellings, but that's not the proposal. It's proposed, I believe, that it's all at some stage to be used by everyone. 
but the buildings themselves and therefore the, the land it's built on and the material they have around them is in a non-contaminated area. So I, I presume I've got confirmation of that from Nobs, from Barry and others, um, and that reassures me um, that this is something we have to bite the bullet and just go with it. Thank you, Mr. Byam. Uh, Mr. Stennett. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, what a difficult situation we find ourselves in. I think uh, between a rock and a hard place underestimates it, and I feel really sorry for the people down Noel Lane. However, a point that was made tonight is that those lorries can go in and out of there already running bricks and running other things. There is permission for that. I had to have a little chuckle at the expert for the applicant over there saying lorries today are smaller. The ones they're going to use are smaller. Well, they've got longer and heavier, maybe on more axles. There you go. I would also like to say that they've got, from a vibration point of view, and uh, as you all know, probably I'll run a lorry of my own, um, the air suspension is much better. The weight uh, dispersion is very good. Uh, Euro 6 for air pollution is a tremendous thing. So there isn't the air pollution that we were all used to many years ago. And the, the, uh, the trucks are a lot quieter, which is very nice. Uh, so therefore, whilst I really feel sorry for the people down Noel, I think this is a situation we find ourselves in. I think it's a solution to the problem forever. And I would also like to pick up on what the EA have said here about membranes. Uh, you get land subsidence, they do split, and then you have a real problem. And the way that is proposed is much better. And if it's any consolation to the uh, people of Noel Lane, Sewards, who are part of this application, in uh, my uh, 47 years of running my own company, have always looked very presentable. Their trucks are in good order. And to me, they run a very nice operation. So I'm sure that any problems will be sorted out. In normal circumstances, I wouldn't be agreeing with this, but it's a problem we're faced with, and I think we've got no other options. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mrs Stennett. Sorry, uh, Chairman. Um, if members feel that this site has to be so urgently cleaned up and it has to be done now, what safeguards are there that the applicant will carry out this work to the environment, environment agency's specific requirement? Will there be checks regularly carried out? Will there be somebody on site who will say, this is what we're doing, and if the lorries do not, if they do not do as they're supposed to do, if they try and take alternative routes, if they try and go in too heavy or come out too heavy, is there somebody there that would look after this site? Is there a permanent person that is in charge of the site? Can somebody answer that for me? Please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, you... As part of the environmental agency permitting regulations, they will have to keep records. Vehicles will have to come in and give their documentation over. That documentation will have to be kept. That documentation will set out where the load has come from, what type of material is stored in the load, and how it's been used on site. That material will be, will be kept and have made available to local planning authority officers to investigate and look if we think there's anything gone wrong. And also the environment agency will periodically check it. The Environment Agency will also t turn up occasionally and carry out their own testing to make sure that what's in the ground should be in the ground. The applicant will carry out their testing as well to discharge their permit regulations. And then we have paragraph 38 talks about the need of volumes and specific, so the details of the volumes and specifications, the geotechnical and chemical of all important materials to be submitted to us and to the EA for the construction quality assurance criteria for the engineered composite capping system to be submitted to them and to us for approval and also for the leach shape management system. So it's been tied up as much as we possibly can to make sure the EA do their job and we do our job to monitor it. With regards to how the sub monitoring can take place of vehicles doing things they shouldn't possibly be doing, that is where the community liaison group would step in and we would be looking for that group that would be drawn up. The terms of that group will be part of a legal agreement. What they have to do will be part of a 
of a legal agreement, and it would be required to have representatives of the parish council, local members, and to have a reporting system to the developers of anything that's gone wrong, and a system of telling that group how they've put it right. So there will be some control going forward in that way. So as much as we can tie them up, we've done so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Goodrich, you wanted to come back. If I could come back just really on something that Mr. Lomax said earlier on about uh, the state of the site now compared to, say, 10 years ago. I, I was left with an impression, and I may be wrong, that the, the one thing that has got worse is that since the buildings are starting to deteriorate, there's more asbestos around than there was, say, 10 years ago. So it's not a question the pollutants are the same but the regulations have become more severe, it's actually the pollutions are going up as well, particularly on the asbestos side of it. Have I got that right or wrong? Sorry, my confusion. With regards to the reason why this site is a special site, its special designation comes from its pollution into the water. So that is steady, but the level's dropping. The asbestos, you're correct, is now a problem. That wasn't before, and that is, as it's left over time, the asbestos is degrading further and causing more of a problem. So sorry, my confusion. The, the reason why the site is designated the water framework element bit of it is steady, but the regulations are dropping, but the asbestos is a new one, and that is, as it's left, getting worse. So sorry for the confusion. Thank you very much. Mr. Stennett. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to come back. Um, if I can further relay the fears, hopefully, uh, of the people of Noel Lane, the wheel wash system and we talk about asbestos um, fibers when the lorries drive onto the wheel wash and they that they drive the wheel wash with the power of their own wheels the whole vehicle is washed it goes over the whole thing not only the wheels the body the the, the, the tipper on the back is so from with regards to removing contaminated waste from the site um, it's washed before it comes in and also I would assume that good practice is going to follow that any contaminant that comes out of there comes out in sealed containers, sealed roofs, so there really should be minimised everything if it, the job is done properly. I know it's not nice to have the trucks passing by every day um, but it is the end of a solution for our generations to come and I think it's a must. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Siebel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I think uh, all the arguments uh, pro and con doing the work have been made, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where uh, I think if we don't approve it, then all we're doing is, is delaying, delaying a solution. Um, doing nothing doesn't seem to be an option to me. So the, the only concerns I, I'd like to talk to are uh, related to slightly further afield on the, um, the traffic side. Um, particularly relating to the three parishes in my ward. Uh, we're going to have the impact of a large number of truck movements on the 281, potentially through Bramley, uh, where exhaust emissions, noise, vibration, and overall road safety will be a significant concern for the residents. And then there's the risk of trucks blocking the narrow roads in Busbridge and Hascombe if they transit between sources of fill coming from Waverley and Hampshire to the work site. And they don't, I don't think there are any options to, to get to the work site uh, uh, through Bresbridge and Hascombe that don't avoid totally inappropriate roads. So I'm very pleased that the applicants have um, uh, recognised the need to mitigate the impact of trucks passing through Bramley with their uh, agreement to fund improved signage through the village. That, that's very welcome. Um, note that the uncertainties as to where the trucks are going to origi originate from make uh, specific regulation of journeys very difficult, but it is disappointing that trucks cannot be specifically precluded from using roads in Busbridge and Hascombe, which are unsuitable. Um, so I I'm assuming that the community liaison scheme will, will cover the opportunity for the parishes to participate in discussion of um, use of inappropriate roads and uh, perhaps the officers could confirm that there will be an opportunity to sanction operators who repeatedly try to use roads that are not suitable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any sanctions wouldn't be from the authority, they would be from the developer. It would be a self-policing regime, and it, it, it must be in effect because it would be very difficult to prove that a lorry in Busbridge A, isn't picking up stuff in Busbridge, because if it is, it needs to be there to get out of there, and B, 
it may be picking stuff up there and not going to Cranley Rubric and Tile. It could be going somewhere else. So it would be very difficult to control lorry routes. The old uh, planning circular that was uh, replaced when we had the National Planning Practice Guidance specifically said you shouldn't really control lorry, lorry routes by way of planning condition because it's so tremendously difficult to enforce. In this case, because of the limits on weight, bridge, weight going north along Knoll Lane, there is a legitimate reason to have the signage in place to say you must go down Wildwood Lane, and that is a, an approved route anyway. But what I would say is the developers will have responsibility because in that liaison group to, if anybody raises any issues, to investigate it and to respond back and set out what they've done to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mrs. Harris. Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to come back. Very briefly, if I could refer back again to the lorries. I'm thinking about the issue of these lorries going from Wildwood Lane onto um, the A281, or even coming the other way, actually, because I'm obviously not certain where they'll be coming from or where they're going to. But I suspect that there are going to be lorries trundling onto the 281 or off, crossing the, uh, the upcoming traffic. I know, referring back as well to the Smithbrook Kiln site, and perhaps it was because it was a Surrey County Council site, but as a temporary measure, they installed traffic lights at the entrance to the site, to and from the Surrey, the A281. And I wonder, bearing in mind that this is a very fast stretch of the A281 with a history, I think, of quite nasty accidents, whether there is not the opportunity to request or perhaps put a condition that traffic lights could be installed, perhaps as a temporary period, at this um, access point from and to Wildwood, Wildwood Lane from the A281. Thank you. Thank you very much. Harry? Um, we've consulted with the Highways Authority and they haven't raised the issue, so it's certainly something that I would advise that this committee doesn't impose such a, such a condition, given the absence of support from the county. What the county have done, at that junction of the 281 and Wildwood Lane, there is anti-skidding um, measures to be put into place, increasing the anti-skidding uh, material on the roadway south by 100 metres, because it's travelling north, which is where the problem is with that junction. But also to aid in the need not to skid, they are introducing signage to say there's a, a side road entrance coming up on the right in advance of the skid um, material, and also vegetation on the left-hand side of the road as you travel north is also to be cut back so as to improve visibility for those travelling north. So the county have investigated from a highways point of view, and they think that it is safe without having traffic. Because as a general, the 281 is a reasonably busy road, as a busy road, the increase in traffic as a result of this proposal isn't significant. It is significant on, there is going to be an increase in Wildwood Lane and Knoll Lane, that's without a doubt, that movement. But as they get to the 281 and they dissipate 50% north, 50% south on average, they just blend into the general traffic modelling. So um, I hope that covers your question. Thank you. Mrs. Stennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me come back yet again. I wanted to pick up on what had already been mentioned about Wildwood Lane. Is it possible to ask the Highways Authority perhaps to put a temporary 30 mile an hour limit down that lane if it is, as Mrs. Ellis suggests, 40 at the moment? And one other thing, knowing the area quite well, if you're coming down the hill from Warfog Crossways toward the Wildwood Lane turning, Mrs. Ellis is quite right, it is a very fast piece of road and the bend comes through, you can't actually see that turning as you're coming down the hill. So signage would need to be quite visible in well in advance before that turning. But Wildwood Lane is very, very narrow, and a 30 mile an hour limit would go a good way to allaying perhaps local spheres with the lorries going up and down it. 
thank you very much. If I just, um, on the first instance about traffic travelling northbound on the 281 and turning into Wildwood Lane, that is a, a fast road, it's a 60 mile an hour, it's a national speed limit road, but at the moment, because of the foliage coming over the top, they have only a forward visibility of, a, of 110 metres, which equates to a stopping distance of a car travelling at 50 miles an hour. The speed on that road is a 60 mile an hour speed limit, which necessitates 155 forward visibility spray, and that will be achieved by cutting back that foliage, having the anti-skid material, and also a sign well in advance. So that should cover any concerns. You would have the correct visibility forward of, um, to, to necessitate the visibility required, the sign, and also the right-hand turn, uh, the anti-skid material. With regards to reducing the speed limit on Wildwood Lane, the county authority, highways authority, have looked at that, and they consider that the 40 mile an hour is acceptable there, subject to having repeater signs to remind people it's a 40 mile an hour. I think the problem talking with our highway colleagues isn't the fact that it's a 40 mile an hour speed limit along that road. I think it's the fact that people don't travel at 40 miles an hour when using that road. They're travelling in excess of the speed limit. This repeater signs will... will um, cover that and as will the cutting back of the vegetation of Wildwood Lane and exposing the edges to allow passing places to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Forzewski. Once again, thank you, Chairman, for letting me come back. I just wanted to pick up on something and I'll stand corrected. Um, Councillor Stennett, Stuart Stennett had mentioned about contaminants coming off site. I'm under the impression no contaminants would leave the site because going back to what we said before, I believe the vehicle movements out would not be the same as vehicle movements in and that was down to um, viability, financial viability more than anything else. So can I just have your reassurance that no contaminants will leave the site because if they do of course we do know that they're properly licensed vehicles who will transport it out. Thank you Chairman. Thank you Mr Chairman. The only um, contaminants off site is the bulk asbestos that's, so nothing else goes off-site apart from the bulk asbestos. You'll see that there are conditions in the report that limit the site being used as a facility for screening materials and then taking stuff off-site. We've asked for all records of rejected loads to be kept and made available to the authority, and everything that comes onto this site is to be used on-site. There will be some loads that have to come off because they contain um, metal bars, rebars, and structural stuff that can't go into the holes. That will need to leave. But the only thing that will be from site leaving will be the bulk asbestos. And um, one thing we haven't touched on, the leachate management facility going forward has a system of a new leachate facility with water running into the leachate facility and being dealt with on site. Now the leachate will go through a drying process, water evaporated off, the heavy metal residue will be taken off site by vehicles, but that will be a vehicle, a very, very small vehicle, it will be a, a small amount. If I can just um, talk of the leachate. At the moment, leachate is leaving the site of between 25,000 to 30,000 cubic metres per year. The proposal will take it down to 750 cubic metres per year, and it is that, when the water evaporates off, that will be rolled up in the material and taken off site. So that will leave, asbestos will leave, a small amount of rejected material will be left, but that's it. Everything is coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, Barry, there was some mention been able to lay, put my fingers on it about uh, wheel washing facilities on the site. I assume that will cover those lorries transporting asbestos off. Yep. So if I take you to your update sheet, and I found this a second ago and probably won't be able to find it now. Which was it? No, it is early on. They, it, it's a condition that used to read, shall be, details should be submitted, but details have been submitted, and the condition now says that the development shall be carried out in accordance with the wheel washing facilities. It's page 12, condition 27. Before any of the operations which involve the movement of materials in bulk to or from the site are commenced, facilities shall be provided in accordance with the document Details of Wheel Washing Facilities, version A, June 2015. So they've submitted details, and as Councillor Stennett has suggested, they are, it is a wheel washing facility that um, is powered by the movement of the lorry and washed, and then it leaves. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. I 
I can't remember who actually suggested it, members, but uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, five and a half years of uh, uh, lorry movements, ev one every nine minutes, uh, the impact of that um, for the residents of Hazelwood Cottages is probably going to be the worst. Somebody suggested, in fact, that um, maybe there might be a condition for double glazing for Hazelwood Cottages to try and reduce the noise. I wonder what members think about that, whether or not we might uh, seek to um, press for that. Barry. If I may come back, um, what is important, environmental impact assessment demonstrates that noise will not be a problem on site. Noise from traffic will be around 3.4 decibels, which will be barely perceptible to the average human from our colleagues at Environmental Health have provided that. So then the question would arise, would such a condition meet the tests in the National Planning Practice Guidance of being necessary, proportionate? And I would advise against having such a condition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other speakers? I think has been uh, said several times this evening already, having uh, uh, considered this site since I think it must have been 2003, 2004, here we are in 2015, uh, doing nothing is not an option. So let members go to the um, revised condition if there are no further speakers. On page 19 of the update sheet, you have a revised uh, uh, recommendation. I could read it, but then you could read it themselves, yourselves. Uh, conditions 21 to 29, 33, 37 to 45, 52, 54 to 55, 58 to 65 have all been amended. And there are additional conditions 58 to 65. There are 1 to 12 informatives on the main agenda and informatives 13 to 16 added on the update sheets as well. Sorry. And the condition of £10,000 to Bramley Carish Parish Council for highway signage improvements. Um, the, the officer's recommendation is that permission be granted. Can I see those members in favour of the officer's recommendation, please? And I don't see any abstentions or against. Permission then, subject to all those conditions and informatives, uh, is granted. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we are concluded for the evening. Have a safe journey home.